heat index in the Gupan City soars to dangerous 51.7 degrees Celsius. The DTI sees possible increase of prices of vegetables in the market due to the prevailing El Nino phenomenon. Poverty incidence in the Philippines drops in the first quarter of 2019. And the Center for Disease Control warns about drug-resistant superbug fungus that sickens hundreds across the United States. Good evening. Weather experts said the temperature in the Philippines gradually increased for the past decades. Ray Pelayo tells us why. The Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or Pagasa recorded yesterday the highest heat index in the Gupan City, Pangasinan, that reached 51.7 degrees Celsius. But a weather expert in the agency that this record may be broken in the coming days due to the effects of the El Nino phenomenon. During El Nino, mas mataas tayo sa normal. So, siguro pwede pa tayo maka-expect ng mas mataas na until May. The highest temperature ever recorded in the country is 42.2 degrees Celsius in the city of Tuyagrao in Cagayan on April 22, 1912 and on May 11, 1969. According to Cinco, actual temperature is different from heat index which mainly affects the body temperature. Yung ramdam mong init, yung mainit na, mas mainit pa yung maramdaman mo dahil sa hindi yung pawis mo, hindi nag-evaporate. Pag yung mababot ka ng 37 degrees, parang nilalagnat ka, di ba? Yung gano'n na temperature. Pag-asa weather observer Nelson Goli takes note of the hourly temperature in the Science Garden in Quezon City. The instruments he uses are housed in a special wooden box outdoor to avoid being affected by direct sunlight and rain. Yung uh, dry bulb uh, thermometer, uh, same din ang maximum thermometer. So bali, ito yung parang sa mga, ano, ginagamit din ng mga bata na, sa mga bata na may sakit, may lagnat na thermometer. Goli also observes cloud above and around the area. Pagasa said that the location of a synoptic station should be at a distance from houses and high-rise structures and must not be surrounded by rocks because this might affect the accuracy of the actual temperature in the environment. Inside Pagasa's synoptic station are aero vanes which can measure both wind speed and direction. There are also rain gauges to measure the amount of rainfall. Pagasa also has ultrasonic equipment which records wind gusts. After data are gathered, they will be transmitted to Pagasa's main office for forecasters to analyze. Nakuha natin temperature ngayon is 32.3. Pagasa observed there has been an annual 0.1 degrees Celsius increase in temperature in the country since 1951. If this is not mitigated, the Philippines may experience stronger, more devastating tropical cyclones, Pagasa says. Ang temperatura pag nagbago dyan, pwede magkaroon tayo mga extremes, like hayan, yung mga ganun na extremes that could bring disaster. Food security may also be affected because climate affects agriculture. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. Farmers in Catanduanes, Bicol calls for help from the local government. Alan Manansala explains why. In Barangay Kawit, Bira, Catanduanes, farmers have been experiencing losses. The soil in their rice fields is parched. <laughs> Based on records from the Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or PAGASA, Catanduanes is among the parts of the country that experienced drought in March. On the other hand, the Department of Agriculture Region 5 said that based on data at hand, the province is not on the DA's list of areas hit by El Nino. You need to prioritize it. Saan ba malaki? Lang dito yan sa rice areas, which is our stable. Hmm. Oh, yun pa yung mga... So, so talaga wala pa talaga stable? I mean, meron na yan. Hindi pala nakakarating. Oh, Siguro... Wala, wala pa Despite this, 
Once more than one hectare rice field is extremely dry so his crops can no longer be harvested for food. While in Leon's field, the palai he planted no longer grows. Both Leon and Juan say they have not received any assistance from the local government despite the effects of El Nino they have been experiencing which affect their bread and butter. To respond to this, the Department of Agriculture Region 5 said they will act on the matter for farmers like Juan and Leon to receive aid from the government. Siguro coordination work with their respective NGOs kung affected sila, uh, they should come out and provide details para uh, kung sakaling uh, available na at pwede lang magtanim makaka-deliver kami po ng services na, na naka-activate din sa programa. I'm sure may rehab practice. Alan Manansala, UNTV News and Rescue, Katanduanes. The National Grid Corporation or NGCP lowered its red alert in the Luzon Grid to yellow which would remain until 9 p.m. on Wednesday. On its advisory, the country's grid operator said the red alert notice was lifted at 4.46 p.m. The NGCP defines red alert as a system condition where there is zero ancillary service or a generation deficiency exists. A yellow alert, meanwhile, is a system condition in which the reserves are less than the capacity of the biggest plant in Luzon. Despite the low supply reserves, the Department of Energy said it is not expecting any power interruption to occur in the region because of the available supply under the Interruptible Load Program. The DOE also continued to appeal to consumers rather to use energy wisely during this dry season. The Department of Trade and Industry fears the vegetables will have high prices in local markets. Joe Anano tells us why. The Department of Trade and Industry or DTI mentions the possible higher prices of vegetables in local markets because of El Nino. In the meeting of various government agencies, which are parts of the National Price Coordinating Council, actions to be taken by the government were discussed to mitigate the effects of the phenomenon. The DTI said the government must give aid to farmers for them to continue their production despite extreme weather conditions. Particularly vegetables, gulay. Gulay talaga yung binabantayan natin because of the drought now now happening in several regions in the country. So production has halted, I understand. Um, and we intend to address this through the NPCC by finding out how we can help the farmers um, continue production or... Um, minimize at least the ill effects of El Nino. DTI today also conducted another price monitoring inspection in a public market and grocery store in Manila. The DTI found out that some vendors are selling chicken and sugar at prices higher than the suggested retail price or SRP issued by the department. Instead of selling chicken at 120 pesos per kilogram, their price is 135 to 160 pesos per kilogram. Refined sugar in a popular supermarket is being sold at 57 pesos per kilogram, while brown sugar is at 49 pesos and 50 centavos per kilogram. These are quite higher compared to the 50 pesos per kilogram SRP of refined sugar and 45 pesos brown sugar SRP. Kinausap natin sila na baka pwede na sumunod sila sa SRP. Siyempre sa umpisa, pakiusap muna. Pag hindi natin nakita na nag-comply nag sila, tsaka natin sila i-issue ng violation. Meanwhile, the prices of some agricultural products remain to be stable, such as fish and pork despite the worsening effects of El Nino. Joa Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Less Filipinos fell into poverty in the first quarter of 2018. According to a report from the Philippine Statistics Authority or PSA, the poverty incidence in the country dropped in January through April of last year. This means the number of poor Filipinos fell from 22.22% in the first quarter of 2015 to 16.1% in the same period of last year. This is equivalent to 23.1 million poor Filipinos reported in 2018 compared to the 28.8 million in 2015. 
The Duterte administration welcomes that report. According to presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo, this shows the government has made significant strides to address poverty. However, the government will not rest to attain the target 14% or better poverty incidence until the end of President Rodrigo Duterte's term in 2022. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, on Tuesday lowered its global growth forecast for 2019 to 3.3% in the newly released World Economic Outlook, or WEO, report, down to 0.2 percentage point from its estimation in January. The IMF has said the world economy faces downside risks brought by potential uncertainties in the ongoing global trade tensions as well as other country and sector-specific factors. The 3.3% projection for 2019 is 0.3 percentage below the 2018 figure, followed by an expected return to 3.6% in 2020. Growth rate projections for advanced economies are 1.8% for 2019 and 1.7% for 2020, both below the 2% plus rates recorded in the previous two years, according to the WEO report. <music> Doctors warn New Yorkers against a fatal and drug-resistant fungus that has already infected hundreds of people. MJ Pineda explains why. Doctors at the National University Medical Center warned New Yorkers to take caution against a drug-resistant, sometimes fatal superbug fungus that has infected hundreds of people in tri-state area and nationwide. The recent outbreak of the fungus Candida auris, which was discovered in 2009, was disproportionately affected New York and New Jersey, with 309 of the nation's 617 cases in New York State alone. Typically spread within healthcare facilities, the fungus kills 20 to 50 percent of patients. Anybody who has concerns about fevers, chills, sweats, wound infections, anything like that should seek care as soon as possible. They should um, certainly let their health care provider know about their symptoms. They should let their health care provider know about prior use of antibiotics. They should let their health care provider know about travel. People in hospitals and nursing homes, particularly those already suppressed immune systems, are at the greatest risk of becoming infected. Infection can spread to the blood, heart, or brain in severe cases. The fungus is difficult to identify, as doctors frequently mistake it for other candida strains and even harder to treat because it is resistant to common antifungal medication. This particular species is resistant to um, the azole class, which is the class that we would use first line. So it is possible if you don't know what it is, you may be treating it with an ineffective drug. According to the Center for Disease Control, several U.S. cases of the superbug may be linked to hospital stays in India, Kenya, Kuwait, Pakistan, South Africa, the United Arab Emirates, and Venezuela. The infections occur on two levels. One, it's introduction of the infections from other areas, and clearly the New York, New Jersey area has a high amount of uh, you know, immigrant populations coming from all over the world. And then once it's introduced, then there's spread within um, that community, within that you know, um, organization. MJ Pineda, UN TV News and Rescue, New York, USA. Commercial astronaut Beth Moses became the first female to fly to space on a commercial spaceship and the first non-pilot from Virgin Galactic to fly to space. Nina Armilio tells us why. Virgin Galactic's first test passenger received commercial astronaut wings from the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA on Tuesday after flying on the company's rocket plane to evaluate the customer experience in February. Virgin Galactic's chief astronaut instructor, Beth Moses, joined pilots David McKay and Mike Masucci on Spaceship 2 VSS Unity and becomes the first woman to fly to space on a commercial vehicle. Moses is dubbed commercial astronaut number 007. 
The wings were presented at the 35th Space Symposium in Colorado by the FIA's Associate Administrator for Commercial Space, Wayne Monteith, who said commercial human space flight is now a reality. Uh, some people are really looking forward to boost and high G. Some people are really looking forward to tumbling and weightlessness. Uh, some people feel a connection with a childhood dream or with the universe at large, so a, sort of a combination of feeling, you know, small and yet connected at the same time. The February test flight nudged Richard Branson's space travel company closer to delivering suborbital flights for the more than 600 people who have paid Virgin Galactic about $80 million in deposits. Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin and Elon Musk's SpaceX are also in the space tourism race. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. Former Special Assistant to the President Christopher Bongo accepted the challenge to bear his back to dispel allegations of his link to a supposed illegal drug syndicate. A vlogger and administration critic, however, is not convinced. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. In another video posted on social media, a certain Bicoy is linking former Special Assistant to the President Bongo to a supposed drug syndicate. This Bicoy claims that Go is the third biggest drug personality in the syndicate and that Go supposedly received billions of pesos of drug money from 2010 to 2018. To prove his claim, Bicoy said Go has a dragon tattoo on his back bearing an alphanumeric code. The code Libra, the 0018. The narrator in the video challenges Go to show his back and promise to keep their mouth shut if their claim is proven wrong. Kung may papakita niyang wala siyang tatu sa likod, tatahimik na kami. In a campaign sortie in Agusan del Sur today, Go accepted the challenge. There was no tattoo on his back. At papakita ko sa inyo. Ano? But there are marks which go said were from Ventosa. But a blogger and administration critic doubts this, asking why Go did not let the reporters present touch the marks on his back. Why did he change clothes and would he allow an expert to examine it? In another sortie in Laguna last Monday, Go denied having a tattoo, saying their political opponents are only desperate. <laughs> Malacanang insisted the allegation against Go and people close to President Duterte are mere propaganda. We've been saying all along that that was a black propaganda. There are people who believe it, hook, line, and sinker, and it's now showing that it's not true. It's never been true. On his first video, Bicoy linked presidential son Paulo Duterte to illegal drugs. He also claimed the younger Duterte had a tattoo on his back as proof of his links to a supposed drug syndicate. He posed a similar challenge to the former Davao City Vice Mayor, which the latter has ignored until now. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue. A lawmaker proposes an alternative to the Doble Placa law but a motorcycle riders group is not in favor of the option. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. Some senators who voted in favor of the Doble Placa law maintain their position. According to Senator Sherwin Gachelian, he sees the positive side of the new law, the Motorcycle Crime Prevention Act, especially in the crackdown on riding in tandem criminals in the country. I think pag nakita naman doon sa, let's say, yung checkpoint walang plaka, automatically nato-flag. Eh. No? Dahil may checkpoint all over. Ngayon, kung na-flag ka, uh, wala kang plaka, mahuli ka. Kung may plaka ka, at mayroon kang masamang gagawin, mahuli ka naman. But due to several oppositions to the said law, the senator has found an alternative to implement that kind of law with the same objectives. Senator Gachalian said that in Colombia, motorcycle riders wear a type of vest with imprinted plate number. I think they will study kung kaya through IRR. Kung hindi kaya through IRR, then we have to amend the law. But uh, maganda yan na, ang maganda naman dito napapakinggan ng lahat. No? At kung mayroong safety concern, then we have to really study carefully. And maybe the option of putting it in your vest can be an option. 
But according to the Motorcycle Federation of the Philippines, this kind of vest had long been proposed but they objected. Ang uh, dagdagpasaan na naman niya sa mga mananakay ng motor. Pero yung mga magpapagawa sila ng mga vest na ganyan. Na ang, in, ang in-insist namin, instead na ganyan ang gawin noon, is bakit hindi police the visibility ang uh, pairari mabuti. Motorcycle riders groups in the country are anticipating the release of the Implementing Rules and Regulations or IRR of the Doble Placa Law this month. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Malacanang regards the continued presence of Chinese vessels within the Philippine territory as an attack to our sovereignty. For presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo, the foreign ships must already leave the Philippine territory. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. Aside from the reported presence of Chinese vessels near Pag-asa Island, there have also been reports of the presence of Chinese vessels near Kota Island and Panata Island. Kota and Pata Islands are part of the Kalayaan Island Group which belongs to the Philippines. Presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo said today that once reports are validated, they will be included in the diplomatic protest submitted by the Philippines to China. Then we will object to their presence. We have already filed a diplomatic protest and that applies to everything, anything that concern China's vessels in our territory. Secretary Panelo added if these Chinese vessels continue to be present within our territory, this is an attack to the Filipino sovereignty. The palace reiterates these vessels should go away from the territories of the Philippines. That they will know that we are against it, mm -hmm. that we will not allow it, that we will not tolerate such presence in our territory. Should they go away, sir? Hmm? Should they go away? They should. They have no business being there. Oh, it is. If they continue to be present in our territory, then it is an assault to our sovereignty. The Department of Foreign Affairs has already filed a diplomatic protest to China on the reported presence of Chinese vessels near Pag-asa Island. President Rodrigo Duterte stands firm that this island is ours and he will not allow China to occupy it. He has also mentioned further actions to take if any Filipino soldier or fisherman is hurt or harmed because of the presence of the Chinese vessels. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. The Supreme Court orders Malacanang to answer a petition seeking to nullify the loan agreement for the Chico River Pump Irrigation Project. project. My Bermudez tells us why. In a petition filed by former Bayan Muna portalist Representative Neri Colmenares and opposition lawmakers, they hit the implementation of the loan agreement between the Philippines and China for Chico River Pump Irrigation Project and seek for a temporary restraining order or TRO. They also criticized the declaration of a patrimonial asset as collateral in the deal. An inclusion of a confidentiality clause, they say, also violates the Filipinos' right to know the truth behind contracts entered into by the government. The petitioners also say allowing the Chinese Arbitration Commission as the arbitration body in case payment default happens also violates Philippine laws. The highest court in the country is now asking for an explanation from Malacanang on the petition to nullify the agreement. Several cabinet members were also ordered to explain. These include Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea, Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez, National Economic and Development Authority Chief Ernesto Pernia, Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara, and National Irrigation Administration Chief Ricardo Visaya for the 62 million US dollar deal. The Supreme Court ordered the respondents to file their comments to the petition within a period of 10 days. Colmenares thanked the Supreme Court for recognizing and giving weight to their appeal, but they still hope a TRO will be granted to stop the implementation of the loan agreement. Malacanang, for its part, vows to follow the Supreme Court's order. However, the palace went on defense and countered the petitioner's allegations. It will respond properly. The loan agreement has passed through many channels. There has been many review evaluations. We feel that it's not in violation of the Constitution as alleged by the petitioner. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, Baguio City.
Filipino delegates from kindergarten to secondary categories bag medals in Phuket, Thailand. Charis Longbo and tells us why. The Philippine delegation to the Thailand International Mathematical Olympiad, or TIMO 2018-2019, held on April 5th to 8th in Phuket, Thailand, brought home the bacon. Competing in the different categories in the final round, which include the kindergarten group, primary level, and secondary level, the Filipino Math Olympiads claimed 28 merits, 57 bronze medals, 41 silver medals, and 39 gold medals. The Filipino medalists expressed their gratitude for the awards they received. I'm so thankful for our parents who, who supported us throughout the competition. And I'm so thankful that our teachers extend their time to learn about math that we can go to Timo. Participating countries included the Philippines, Bulgaria, Laos, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Australia, Myanmar, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, India, Sri Lanka, Iran, Vietnam, and Cambodia, among others. The Philippines also won one second runner-up award, three first runner-up awards, two champions, and one World Star Award. The awardees in the TIMO 2019 will compete at the Hong Kong International Mathematical Olympiad on August 30 to September 2, where the gold awardees will then compete at the World International Mathematical Olympiad on December 27 to 30 in Tokyo, Japan. The Thailand International Mathematical Olympiad is an annual mathematical Olympiad competition organized by the Thailand Mathematics Society. Registrations for the TIMO 2019 to 2020 will begin in second half of 2019. Charis Longbowen, UNTV News and Rescue, Bangkok, Thailand. Did you know that Metro Manila features several interesting pedestrian walkways? Let's find out which walkways there are from Wanokson. Do you love to walk? Or do you often go to work on foot? Possibly, you already know some of the interesting walkways in Metro Manila. The Makati Business District is well known for its underground walkways, which make it easy for pedestrians to get from one road to another in the busy area. The Makati Avenue underpass is praised for its gorgeous artwork that simply shows how talented Filipinos are. Pedestrians are mesmerized by the colorful sketches and designs at the underpass. There will never be boredom while crossing the Salcedo underpass. Although it is under renovation for now, the murals are nice to look at. If you want to go to the outer space, visit Makati's Paseo de Rojas underpass. Featured here is the rocket launcher by illustrator and art director Daniel Tinkunko. Get ready to be taken to a warp zone while crossing this underpass. If you want to experience the longest covered walkway in the Philippines, the De La Rosa Elevated Walkway is the place to go. The walkway extends up to 1.1 kilometers that connects Rufino and Salcedo streets in Makati. It provides a convenient way to walk from the Manila Metro Rail Transit System or MRT Ayala Station to Makati Medical Center. In Quezon City, you can cross the elliptical road using two underpasses. The underpass is wide and well lit. A photo exhibit of the history of Quezon City is displayed along the walkway. In Pasig City, you will find the Ortigas Overpass. It has a wide covered walkway and a dome. The Ortigas Overpass is designed by renowned landscape architect and urban planner architect Paolo Alcazaren. Many opt to use this overpass than to get stranded in heavy traffic within the Ortigas Business District. In case you will be in Manila, you can drop by the Manila City Hall underpass, although it is not so presentable compared with other walkways. It is worth the visit because of the various merchandise such as clothes and shoes on sale. Even classic board games can be bought at low prices. Despite being criticized because it had just been a waste of money, the mini footbridge at the Paraiso ng Batang Maynila, a children's park in Malate, Manila, is quite unique. It had also been tagged by a netizen, the weirdest project in the world. 
unknown to many, it is not actually a pedestrian overpass, but is rather used to train kids on road safety. It is true that many walkways in Metro Manila are not fully utilized. Pedestrians have given up the sidewalks to give way to vendors, motorists who illegally park their vehicles, or sports enthusiasts who use sidewalks as a basketball court. Remember that walkways are for pedestrians, and they must not be obstructed. Mon Hokson, UNTV News and Rescue. Wishers in Butuan City in Mindanao say they enjoy their time during the iconic wish buses visit in their country, in, the, in their city. Minnesota Bogodil will tell us why. From Surigao to Davao City to Cagayan de Oro City, the popular Wish 1075 bus reached the timber city of South, Butuan City. Despite the rain that day, wishers in the city were not hindered from enjoying the sight and sound of the iconic FM booth on wheels. And as what Wish FM innovator Kuya Daniel Rezon wants to achieve to make the Wish Bus an avenue for talented Filipino singers, but one city's talents show. <laughs> Maka flatter gid kay si yeah, Sir kay gamay ra nahatag anog chance makakanta sa Wish Bus. Napakaganda ng concept na to kasi natutulungan lahat yung mga na mga local bands, local talents, artists. Tsaka nagpupunta sila sa mga iba ibang regions. And as expected, the wishers share how they enjoyed the Wish Bus tour in their city. Masaya po. Unang-una, birthday po ng anak ko. Nakakita po kami ng wish dito sa Butuan. Nakaka-aliw, pakinggan. Masaya po at the same time, excited po na marinig yung kanta nila. Sinusubscribe po sila sa YouTube channel nila. Maganda at masarap pakinggan sa tinga. Kasi ang mga kinukuha nila tumututog is yung mga sikat at saka yung mga maganda mga boses. Ma-appreciate na ako nga uh, the wish concept gathers lots of local musicians together. I think that's good for the Filipino culture to empower each other that way. But one city is the last stop of the Wish Bus in its Mindanao leg of provincial tours. Wishers in the Visayas region are now excited as the iconic Wish Bus is heading their way next. Mirasol Abugadil, UNTV News and Rescue. And to finally complete the most significant news for the day, why news continues, here are the top stories. A retired police official running for councillor in Legazpi City was gunned down this afternoon. According to Legazpi City Police, Ramiro Bausa, 57 years of age, was visiting a friend when he was attacked in Barangay Cagbacong around 3.20 p.m. Bausa suffered gunshot wounds on his head and other parts of the body. Police said that according to Joven Llanto, Bausa's driver, he was approached by two unidentified persons and offered him to leave the area minutes before the incident. Bausa was a member of the Philippine National Police Academy Batch 87 and was assigned as director of the Camarines Sur Police in 2014. In 2010, Bausa's brother Enrique, former chief of Daraga Town Police in Albay, was also gunned down on a campaign trail as town councillor. Meanwhile, President Rodrigo Duterte believes that ISIS-inspired terrorist groups will never gain foothold anywhere in the Philippines. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. President Rodrigo Duterte is confident that the government is close to crashing violent extremism in the country because of the military's intensified operations against the ISIS-inspired terrorist Abu Sayyaf group. It can be recalled that the Islamic State-linked militants invaded Marawi City in the province of Lanao del Sur for five months in 2017, which led to the destruction of the provincial capital. President Duterte made a statement when he visited Holong Sulu yesterday at an event dedicated to the commemoration of the Day of Valor. The chief executive also said that ISIS will never again foothold anywhere in the Philippines. I am especially pleased 
with our military's recent accomplishments against the Abu Sayyaf group. Your efforts have brought us even closer to our ultimate objective of totally crushing the violent extremism at its roots. With this, I can confidently declare that ISIS will never gain foothold anywhere in the Philippines. The President also assured Filipino soldiers of the government's continued assistance. I will continue to release 500 more and 500 more millions to my soldiers to do something Do not worry, I have three years. I will see to it that you will have funds when you retire and that your school, uh, your children under schooling will be assured even if we are no longer there, either by natural or by any other means of saying goodbye to this world. Sagot, I have your back over. Aside from this, President Duterte also mentioned his plans to give government post to former military officials. This, although he had repeatedly said he is not after the military's loyalty. Hindi ako sabihin na pinapalakas ko ang sarili ko sa military because I do not need that. The people elected me. But ako, I have a special fondness for the military for being fundamentally honest at industrious. Ano lang ako sa bureaucracy because you have met several failures pati hindi mo mautosan ng matino. Puro corruption. Kaya, as you would see, yung unang, the next few officials coming in uh, would be military guys. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The highest heat index or indicator of human discomfort was recorded in Dagupan City, Pangasinan on Tuesday, the State Weather Bureau said. The Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administra Administration, or PAGASA, registered a heat index of 51.7 degrees Celsius at around 2 p.m. This is higher than the previous record of 48.2 also in Dagupan on April 3. In Metro Manila, the highest heat index was recorded at the Ninoy Aquino International Airport in Pasay City at 42 degrees Celsius. According to Pagasa, the heat index from 41 degrees Celsius to 54 degrees Celsius may be classified under the danger category where individuals may experience heat cramps and exhaustion that could lead to heat stroke. Pagasa also warns the public against heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Senatorial candidate and former special assistant to the president, Christopher Bongo, bears his back before the public today. To prove that he has no tattoo on his back, he took the shirt off during a campaign sortie in Agusan del Sur today. Go has been accused of being the third biggest drug personality in the syndicate, supposedly received billions of pesos of drug money from 2010 to 2018 by a certain Bicoy in what appears to be a series of videos entitled Ang Totoong Narco List or The Real Narco List. This Bicoy also claims Go has a dragon tattoo on his back bearing an alphanumeric code. Go said after taking off his shirt, the marks on his back are merely birthmarks. <laughs> and for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C. live from Hong Kong. Stephanie, good evening. Uh, yes, Stephanie, good evening. New York City declare a public health emergency requiring unvaccinated people in the affected areas to get the vaccine or face fines. Marie Peñaranda will tell us why. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio declared a public health emergency this in parts of Brooklyn on Tuesday 
ordering all residents to be vaccinated to contain a measles outbreak concentrated in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. The Blasio said the emergency covers four Brooklyn zip codes, including most of Williamsburg and Borough Park, which have seen more than 285 cases of missiles since October. The only way to stop this outbreak is to ensure that those who have not been vaccinated get the vaccine. Uh, it's crucial for people to understand the measles vaccine works. It is safe, it is effective, it is time tested. The order mandates that all unimmunized children and adults living or working in the area must receive vaccinations unless they can prove a medical exemption applies. Those who do not comply could be guilty of misdemeanor violations and incur $1,000 fine. Measles is a highly contagious disease and can cause pneumonia, encephalitis and death. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says two doses of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine are about 97% effective in preventing the disease. Tuesday's order follows another decree by the city's health department issued a day earlier that any yeshivas in Williamsburg that continue to defy the mandatory exclusion of all unvaccinated children will immediately be issued a violation and face fines and possible school closures. The epicenter of a measles outbreak uh, that is uh, very, very troubling and must be dealt with immediately. The mandatory vaccination order follows an order from the health department last week requiring reshivas and daycare programs serving Williamsburg's Orthodox Jewish community to exclude unvaccinated children or face fines or closure. Health officials in Rockland County, a northern suburb of New York City last month also banned unvaccinated children from visiting public places for 30 days. The order was temporarily halted by a judge last week. A growing and vocal fringe of parents oppose vaccinations, believing contrary to scientific evidence that ingredients in the vaccines can cause autism or other disorders. There is a campaign with very intentional efforts to give misinformation, and we're here to correct the record. Health officials also expressed alarm at reports of parents in the city holding so-called measles parties where they intentionally expose their unvaccinated children to uninfected child in the mistaken belief doing so is a safe means to create immunity. I understand that parents may be afraid of getting their children vaccinated, but the reality is as a pediatrician who has vaccinated hundreds if not thousands of children, I know that getting vaccinated is far safer than getting the measles. Marie Peñaranda, UNTV News and Rescue, USA. The White House said it would appeal a court ruling that halted a Trump administration policy requiring some asylum seekers to return to Mexico and wait for their legal cases to proceed. Nomar Peñaranda tells us why. U.S. President Donald Trump has lashed out at a judge for blocking his policy of sending asylum seekers to Mexico to await court hearings in their cases. His policy would have returned migrants back over the border while they sought a legal right to stay in the U.S. The legal defeat comes as migrant numbers at the U.S.-Mexico border surged to their highest since 2008. Trump was said to be livid after U.S. immigration officials estimated border apprehensions in March had topped 100,000. We have bad laws. We have a judge that just ruled incredibly uh, that he doesn't want people staying in Mexico. Uh, figure that one out. Uh, nobody can believe these decisions we're getting from the Ninth Circuit. It's a disgrace. Before the appeal was announced, immigrant rights activists and lawyers had expressed relief at Judge Seaborg's ruling. What we've seen again and again under this administration is that in its attempts to attack and villainize and deport immigrants, the administration is ignoring the law and running roughshod over the requirements that Congress has put in place for how our immigration system should operate. The White House said in a statement on Tuesday it would appeal the decision. 
The San Francisco 9th District judge order on Monday against the migrant policy is not due to go into effect until this Friday. No more Peñaranda, UNTV News and Rescue USA. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has won the Israeli national election despite running neck and neck with his challenger Benny Gantz. Meanwhile, a legislator from India's governing Bharatiya Janata Party has been killed in an attack on his campaign convoy. Kathy Maraos will tell us why. In India, at least seven people, including a state legislator for India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, were killed in two separate attacks on Tuesday, officials said, days before India begins a general election. Five people, including BJP lawmaker Bhima Mandavi, were killed in the eastern state of Chahatisgarh after Maoist militants detonated a bomb as Mandavi and his entourage were driving back from a campaign appearance, District Magistrate Topeshwar Verma said. In a separate attack, unknown gunmen burst into a hospital in the northern state of Jammu and Kashmir and killed Chandrakant Sharma, a regional leader of a Hindu group linked to the BJP, along with his bodyguard, a police official said. Authorities imposed an indefinite curfew in the town of Kishwar, bordering the contested Muslim-majority region of Kashmir, claimed by both India and Pakistan, and sent troops to the area. In Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has won the Israeli national election, securing a record fifth term in office despite running neck and neck with his challenger Benny Gantz, the country's three main television channels said on Wednesday. With 97% of the votes counted, neither of the candidates' parties had captured a ruling majority, but Netanyahu was clearly in a strong position to form a coalition government with other right-wing factions that have backed him. The closely contested race was widely seen in Israel as a referendum on Netanyahu's character and record in the face of corruption allegations. He faces possible indictment in three graft cases and has denied wrongdoing in all of them. And in the USA, Facebook and Google on Tuesday defended their efforts to remove hate speech from social media sites amid questions from lawmakers in an appearance before the U.S. House Judiciary Committee. Representative Gerald Nadler, who chairs the panel, said white nationalist groups target communities of color and religious minorities through social media. Social media firms use algorithms and human reviewers to remove hateful speech. In November, the FBI said U.S. hate crimes jumped 17% in 2017 with a 37% spike in anti-Semitic attacks. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you very much. Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. NBA All-Star Dirk Nowitzki announces a decision everyone expected after a rousing performance in Tuesday's home finale. Asher Kadapan Jr. will tell us why. Uh, as you guys might expect, uh, this was my last home game. Dallas Mavericks star Dirk Nowitzki, who was yeah. mom all season on his future plans, finally made his much-anticipated retirement announcement on Tuesday after delivering a season-high 30-point performance with five three-pointers against the Suns. On this special night, Nowitzki turned back the clock and so did the crowd, who applauded and went on standing ovation. Anyway, so I want to thank my family. A lot of people flew in from all over the world. There are lots of them from, from Germany. My dad's here, my sister. Uh, all sorts of people. So, and uh, anyways, uh, I'm really speechless for that. Uh, but Mark, I think you want to say a few words, but it's been an amazing ride. And thank you guys so much for coming out. Nowitzki, who was born on the 19th of June 1978 in Würzburg, Germany, finishes his 21st season and final season Wednesday at San Antonio. Dirk trails Michael Jordan among the NBA all-time scoring leaders, placing 6th with 3,540 points as of today, according to stats.nba.com. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News & Rescue.
A Cristiano Ronaldo lookalike grabs attention in northern Iraq thanks to the resemblance he has with one of the world's famous soccer stars. Nina Armilio tells us why. Northern Iraq's Biwar Abdullah enjoys the attention of a celebrity everywhere he goes. Thanks to his uncanny resemblance to Portugal national team captain Cristiano Ronaldo. And to cap it off, he is an amateur soccer player. I'm a young man from the city of Soran. I look like the Portuguese football player Cristiano Ronaldo. A lot of people tell me that I look like Cristiano, apart from whether I'm an Arab, Kurdish or foreigner, the important thing is that I meet him one day. 25-year-old Biwar said he hails from a poor family and works in the construction to make ends meet. Biwar oftentimes gets stopped in shops or on the street and asked for selfies. He also has a good number of followers on social media. Biwar has a lot of fans and we are very happy for that. People love him much, especially residents of Soran. Biwar grew up in his hometown of Soran, a city 110 kilometers away from Erbil, the capital city of Kurdistan. The Juventus star's body is double that of Biwar's, but the lookalike hopes someday to meet and be like the real Cristiano Ronaldo. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this April 10, 2019. On behalf of Vina Villamor Camara and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites because we need to know. We will always ask why. Good evening. Siguro pwede pa tayo maka-expect na mas mataas na uh, for until May. Gulay talaga yung binabantayan natin because of the drought now now happening in several regions in the country. So production has halted, I understand. With this, I can confidently declare that ISIS will never gain foothold anywhere in the Philippines. This particular species is resistant to um, the azole class, which is the class that we would use first line. So it is possible if you don't know what it is, you may be treating it with an ineffective drug. But it's been an amazing ride and Thank you guys so much for coming out. I'm so thankful that our teachers extend their time to learn about math, that we can go to Timo.